I'm very pleased to, to be here today and for the invitation. Thank you so much. Not only in Lund, but also in Skåne region, which in my opinion is a leading region in Scandinavia for uh, culture and uh, healing environments and yeah, care as such. So I'm very pleased to be here. And unfortunately, this is not Denmark. It used to be Denmark some hundred years ago, but uh, it's not Denmark now. But I'm really pleased to be here and you play this Sorry. central role. So, sound environment, you know. <laughs> the topic today is uh, acute illness and I have uh, certain skills there because my professional uh, career has been anesthesia and intensive care. Certainly that's the worst part of acute illness, but that gives me even further insight into the, the item. I may present some news here today, but also you should know that this is an ancient history. And actually, uh, you can, I can promise you, wherever you go, every tribal uh, medicine man would use sound in order to make you feel well. So this is not news, actually. Yet, nursing, I can keep it in my hand, so it's better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll keep it here. I think it's better. Uh, also, you know this nurse who uh, was an icon for the present nursery. Florence Nightingale, she thought that noise in hospitals was the most cruel absence of care which can be inflicted on either sick or well. Uh, and since her active days as a nurse, it has just got worse every year and it still is getting worse every year. So we have to turn that uh, into an improvement instead of a worsening. I may also comment that she made this statement during the Krim War, you know, it was wartime, so maybe the cannons were in the background at that point of time. I'm going to tell you about what I believe in, but still, and I believe in holistic uh, therapy. That means I, as a doctor, can may change the hip or repair a fracture or make people survive, replace a heart, but you have to, to, to have the whole soul with it, uh, with the patient before they really improve and become cured. Uh, I remember one of the pilot studies in a cart lab unit where the doctors put in some dilators in the coronary vessels and after the dilatation the patient is cured, he's, he's well. And when we asked the doctor, when do you think this patient feel well? And he, he said one or two days. And the real answer was 22 days. And this just shows that the patient's opinion and attitude towards feeling well is different from the doctor's. I'm not going to say a lot about uh, numbers and uh, documentation because that's all there in the literature and you can find it if you look in the databases. I'm not going to talk about uh, wound healing time. I, I kind of think this is a documented statement now that music intervention is a medical issue. It's part of the treatment. And as a doctor, I think it's important that doctors and nurses and everybody in the healthcare think that this is really part of getting well, is using music environment. On top of that, of course, you should, you should avoid negative sounds. And I, I think that others come into that today. I'm primarily focusing on how can we put on some positive sounds. And uh, I can even tell you that in the beginning when we started up with this initiative, it was actually in 1999. It's, it's a long time ago. But uh, that project ended up after being finished in 2003 with a, with a product, a music product, which is sold at the pharmacies in Denmark. And even today, it's very popular. So I mean, this is not just, just a hospital issue or a doctor's issue. The customers, sick people, wants this. It makes them feel better. So there are two sides to this. What I'm going to tell you a little bit about today is the practical application in acute illness. This is very cute, but obviously it only takes three seconds before the baby is sucking the, the loudspeakers or everything else is wrong. I mean, this doesn't stick for a long period. So we have to do otherwise, and I'm just coming into that. So you'll hear my opinion, you'll hear some experience from the present investigations we're doing, 
and we're focusing on the worst case, which is actually ambulances in acute illness. This is where I live, a concrete building. It could be used as a prison, in my opinion. There's no, no positive things about it, except that it's a wonderful city in Aalborg. At the lower left corner, you can see the, the Aquavit factory, which is now a Swedish-owned factory. But the Danish famous Aquavit is actually produced there. But this is my home, and this is my clinical world, at least part of it. I'm a specialist in, in children and neonates, intensive care and anesthesia. We also retrieve the, the babies. You see the baby ambulance. And uh, I also have a lot to do with the FALC organization, which is actually the world's third biggest uh, ambulance entrepreneur uh, in order to improve the conditions there. So this is my everyday life. And this is also my everyday life. I know that some of the other speakers today is coming more into this. But this is a living nightmare uh, to the patients if we don't do anything to improve conditions. You see a lot of staff and in the, in the bed this, it's a child. And all, all equipment here are equipped with alarms, which actually runs most of the time. And over 90% of the times, it's false alarms. So it's just you know, changing everything. And the doctors and the nurses, they leave after certain, maybe eight hours, or at most 12 hours. But the patients may stay there for a week or two. And that just breaks them down if we don't do anything actively. And I, I do think that we should look at this from the patient's perspective. This is kind of a, it's a cartoon. He seems not completely dead. And yes, he's not really dead because you can see the heart beating a little bit. So one could ask, of course, he doesn't move, but his hearing is probably still working. So there's not just a treatment issue, there's also an ethical issue here. Unfortunately, we're all gonna die. And I think you, we should just consider how it should sound when we die. Because the sounds here are very bad. I'll demonstrate that later on. Because we really have recorded the surrounding sounds when one of the patients died in an ambulance. Uh, so you can, you can just think about it. And one of the, the, the key issues here, I think we are blind. I don't know how many medical doctors are here today or how many nurses. But we are all blind. We can't see it. If, if we're not kind of focusing on this, we just do as we used to do, and that's very bad. So uh, I'll just demonstrate it for you, and also demonstrate a little about another aspect, which is the future. This is really not the future, it's the presence, that the, the surgery being performed by doctors, maneuvering robots, which are computers, working actually on a cloud solution, so they could sit in Lund and make operations in Aalborg. And uh, also here, the sound environment, you see this is a very focused doctor. The sound environment would be very, very important for them not to make any errors. It seems, gives the same for medication and so on. I think that many other aspects and acute illness, we should consider sound environment. And then the trauma part is also part of my world that this is very traumatizing. We have to deal with nasty things going on. And uh, we have to have a soothing environment instead of sirens and alarms. It's very frustrating for the doctors and the nurses to be in the trauma. This is a child, actually, with a severe infection in one leg. So my opinion is that if we design environments, we, we improve conditions not only for the patient, but also for ourselves. I'm sure of that, having had that focus for many years. And if you can't remember anything of what I'm saying and you can't remember my name, you always remember me as the guy with the parrot. Because the parrot is moving and that's how we just remember. That's the impression. It, it catches our eyes. One thing I think is important, sound is the first sense we get in the mother's womb. We hear her heart beating. So we have a rhythm even from the start. And probably, I can't document that, but probably all science says that it's the last sense we have. So the last thing we perceive in this world would be a sound. So I think there's a very profound ethics here we should consider too. 
let's say there is a sound environment balance at the hospital or in the acute emergency department. This is some kind of balance. Really, this is not. This is a positive version because the balance is not equal. We have much more negative sounds than we have positive sounds. But when we put on acute illness, it's getting worse. So the negative sounds would always prevail and make acute problems in the environment if we don't think actively about it. Acute illness, uh, in my perspective, would be disasters, cardiac arrest, uh, car accidents, severe trauma and so on. But of course, acute illness may have other perspectives too. Uh, I'm going into acute illness in the regard of pre-hospital issues ambulances, uh, doctors in the pre-hospital area. But before we go into this, I just want to point out that we have all become blind. As I said before, don't ask the doctors if you want to know anything about environment. Look at this. This is a, a young Dane. He's very small, but he's called Magnus anyway. His mother has tried to stimulate him with these uh, colored animals. We have a lot of pigs in Denmark, so we, of course it's a pig up there. Uh, but look at what we as staff has equipped him with. We've dressed him up all in white. And maybe it's not, it's not in English, but I can tell you that the text on his stomach says, belongs to the laundry. <laughs> and that's completely unethical. I mean, but nobody cares. I mean, we've done that for 10 years. So why, why don't we just continue? So we have lost completely lost perception of what we're doing. And at least regarding hearing, it's a very, it's a very important because the, the hearing is defenseless, it's vulnerable, and we can choose between three things, absolute silence, which is not a good thing in many patients' perspective, and we can't pick that choice because it's impossible. But then we can look at everyday hospital and pre-hospital noises, and we can create some music environment around the patient where the patient may flee into this positive sound in order to be bombarded with the negative sounds. I'll give you some examples. Music intervention is what I'm talking about. Not to be confused with music therapy. Music therapy is an academic discipline where one therapist is with a client and they play some music together. So it's a, it's a kind of jam session very different from music intervention where you use recorded music in order to intervene and you can support for well-being, relaxation and comfort and self-management techniques. So uh, that's uh, the definition actually defined by a suite, Ulrike Nilsson. I think it's a, a great responsibility to play music, but, but then in the red I've written, we don't have any clear definition of the fundamental principles because you're allowed to take in a medical device with alarms and noises and everything. You don't take any responsibility for that. If you ask a doctor, okay, you, you brought in this ventilator and it has a terrible sound, an alarm which is terrible, you can't sleep. Who's responsible for this? Is it the doctor? No, no, no. He's just responsible for the ventilation. So, I mean, we have the obligation to be responsible and feel responsible but nobody else cares really. Maybe now, and maybe in the future, but hitherto it's not been like that. I think we should consider what type of music and sound environment, who should deliver the intervention, what is the application project, and who is the target group. I mean, a lot of companies have started being interested in this. I've worked together with a company in uh, San Diego, US, aesthetics and they've made some beautiful solutions concerning, in my opinion, concerning healing environment. But they've just, like the rest of the US, not been focused on sound environment. They are now focusing on it because they know that there are very bad sounds in these uh, very hard uh, environments. But, uh, but they have a focus on this, so uh, US healthcare, Obamacare, probably, they'll also improve this. But they have a focus on aesthetics. They have a lot of focus on humanitarian efforts. And that's uh, in contradiction to what I've told you. I want science. I want documentation. In many American hospitals, they've employed musicians, actually. And this is one of them. And one could ask, she's wandering around, playing music for the patients, five minutes, next ward. 
And I asked her question one, is this the right instrument? Because if I was lying in the bed, you know, listening to this, I would think something had went wrong. So, well, and the, the next question would be, if we look at this as medicine, is this the right dosage? How often should that be given? And so on and so on. So this is more humanitarian than actually it's science. As I, you can kind of understand, I've been working some years in the US with this item. And I just want to show you, because I'm in Sweden, that this hospital in the background in Seattle is called Swedish. So there's a lot of Norwegian and Swedish uh, decision makers over there. And they are very focused on this. And this is one of the research nurses over there, which is a day now living there. So this is my kind of thinking in relation to this. And I think that if we're going to persuade the decision makers, we have to have some solid data. I know from Holland it's the same thing. So uh, maybe you could network with the, the, the Dutch, because they, they, they're into this. In Denmark, it's quite new. Uh, but Hopefully you can discuss that during lunch. OK, what should the right sound be and the right sound quality? Well, uh, I'll give you some demonstration and now you'll, I'll play a film for you in a short while. Uh, but it's not just a, right, a, a question of making the right sound, the right music or whatever. It's also a question of acoustics, because if acoustics is bad, even the right sounds would be bad. So you, you have to consider both the right sounds and the right acoustics. I've recorded here the, the kind of hello. Our hospital says to the patients, this is the ambulance entrance sounds. And after that, I play you what I consider being the hospital sounds. It's a little exaggerated, but listen. This is the entrance where the patients come in. This is the first impression. They're lying on the stretcher, looking up in the air. So they hear a lot, they don't see a lot. So this is a kind of hello, welcome. And inside it sounds almost like this. It's exaggerated, I know, but I'll give you a, a real example in a short while. It's very close to that. Acute illness uh, is a, a thing that often demands an ambulance transport if it's severe. So. Uh, I collaborate a lot with Felk, and uh, focusing on the best, the worst case, actually, we, we trying to focus on that, we focused on the ambulances. And this is also a bit exaggerated, but why don't we turn ambulance into concert halls? Why don't we do that? Because I know that it's uh, by law, you have to have a siren on the roof, and you have to make sounds on the exterior, but why do you have to have these sounds also in the interior? Because if you have a myocardial infarction or child delivery, the, the least thing you should wish for is a siren in your ears. But still, that's what experienced by many, many patients each year. And uh, I'll show you a film now recorded really in real life in Denmark. And all the sounds in the film are recorded close to the patient's ear. We have taken out all human voice. The only voice you hear spoken is electronic voices. Really scary, in my opinion. So this is a patient now with a myocardial infarction, retrieved by the ambulance, brought to the hospital where they meet the doctor. He comes in a fast car. And the doctor's in the ambulance, and they uh, say hello at the hospital. And there, hell breaks loose, because the patient has uh, pulmonary edema, so they have to have a ventilator. So this is what the patient here, and I hope this film works, takes three minutes. Enjoy.
Here comes the doctor. I hope you notice the contrast here, huge. Uh, I brought you, unfortunately, just 30 uh, pieces of our preliminary studies. This is one of the preliminary studies I just want to report, that we went out in the field. Actually, this was my wife and my sitting here and put on this microphone close to the patient's ear. And they went out for myocardial uh, problems, angina, AMI, and so on, life-threatening conditions, and recorded all the sounds which you heard here. And actually one of the patients died, so you, these sounds were in the ear of a dying man. And that's, I think it's, it's, it's an ethical thing we have to consider, we have to do something about this. And the patients had a score of distress and pain, it's in the paper, and uh, it's very unusual, but I've chosen to make a report that you can see here, and you can bring you home and see the network collaborating with this. And, uh, they were interviewed at three different time slots uh, and they all thought that human voice was a very positive thing. So talk to the patient was a very positive thing. And until now, this has not been part of the routine in FELC, talk to the patient. It's not been part of the treatment. 
and soft music was spontaneously asked for by nine of the patients. So in their uh, grief and in their fear, they could ask for music. Nine out of 17, one was dead. Negative sounds make your own impression. So uh, we may, went on with two further studies, and I, I'm going to report that, and you can have that as I said. And the last one we're going to publish now soon. And uh, really, we had to do something very special in uh, the ambulances. Uh, the loudspeakers had to be in the ceiling because they were not allowed to kind of be in the way for the patient's head. And that company has now made loudspeakers with a beam directed down downwards. And this is actually from one of the hospitals in Aarhus, where this is the sound environment hanging in the roof, hitting this area, but not hitting outside the area. There may be some reflections of sound, but they've solved it quite well, in my opinion. So if you go into this, good solutions may be done. But my conclusion, this is close to the end. I think that staff, healthcare personnel, and ambulance personnel should justify why they don't use designed music environment, including acoustic regulation, to improve patient well-being. I think it's the other way around. It's not me who should persuade this being used. I think it's the, 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 the other guys who should justify why they don't use it. So go home and make a change, but don't push too hard. I mean, there's a lot of resistance, at least uh, amongst doctors. Uh, many, at least in the beginning, think about this. 14 years ago, I started off. They thought this was in Danish langhår, which means you have a long hair and you're a hippie type. You're not a real doctor. They're bald and they have big muscles, you know, and very active. So don't be too harsh on them. Instead, look at the possibilities and look all around. And I'm sure that we shall overcome. So um, thank you for listening. <laughs>